OK, it's time for one of those limited budget food challenge things again. And just for fun, we're going to change the rules around a little bit this time. So it's still going to be six meals over the course of two days for one person, myself. But this time the food has to be vegan. No animal derived food products, and that includes eggs, milk, honey, those sorts of things that you can get without killing the animals. Wild foraging is going to be permitted, but only obviously plants and fungi, so no shellfish or anything like that. No homegrown food, no urban foraging, no freebies. From the cupboard, only salt and pepper, black tea and coffee. No other cupboard ingredients. Just to make it a bit more weird and difficult, I'm going to say that purchased products have to be shelf stable. So I can't go out and just buy a load of fresh vegetables. And because some of these rules make it a bit more difficult, in particular, no animal products. So there can't be tins of sardines or cheap cooking bacon or cheap hot dogs or anything like that. This time, I'm going to double the budget, so £4 for two days. Car transport will be permitted this time, along with, as usual, kitchen facilities and unlimited water. One more thing I nearly forgot. Just to make things a bit more difficult, I'm going to avoid palm oil in this one. Just a really quick interruption from Studio Shrimp. If you're looking at these rules and you're confused or maybe angry, someone always is, because you think this is unrealistic or that I just made these rules up, well, you're technically right on that last part. I did just make them all up. But it may be that you've misunderstood the purpose of this exercise and this video. I'll explain more after breakfast. For now though, let me just make it clear that this isn't about saving money or a vegan diet or palm oil or shopping or cooking or foraging or any specific real world scenario. I mean, carry on being upset and wrong about that if you must. I just wanted to say this video might not be what you assumed it was. So, let's go shopping. Right, here's what I got for my money. So I got 500 grams of oats. The porridge oats were 59 pence. I got 500 grams of soup mix. This is pearl barley, red split lentils, yellow and green split peas and marrow fat peas. That's gonna be really good for substance and a fair bit of protein. That was also 59 pence. I got a 400 gram bag of Bombay mix. So Bombay mix is kind of like fried crispy noodles made out of gram flour, but it's also got nuts and fried beans and lentils and things in there as well. That's going to be also good for protein, but also it's spicy, so it's got some good flavour. That cost 75 pence. Got a 200 gram pack of pitted prunes, dried plums in other words. So prunes, that was 69 pence for 200 grams. I've got a 250 gram pack, shelf stable, vacuum pack of cooked beetroot. This is actually kind of like UHT, so it's been heat treated in the pack here, which means it's shelf stable. Beetroot was 35 pence. And then finally for my purchased ingredients, I've got this jar of grilled peppers. Now, it might seem like a bit of a frivolous item, but this is grilled cooked peppers in sunflower oil and olive oil. So this provides fat for cooking, fat for frying and so on, as well as obviously some flavour for some of the things I'm going to have to make. And that jar of grilled peppers was 99 pence, the most expensive item on the table here. So that's my purchased ingredients. I got six items and I, and that, I think that came in at £3.96. So I'm four pence short of my budget. I'm not going to go and try and spend that four pence but we do have to now transform these six packets of stuff plus whatever I can forage into six meals. Okay, day one breakfast is gonna be porridge with prunes. Now, just to get something out of the way, you might be thinking if I eat all these prunes over the course of two days, I will have severe digestive issues. I actually don't suffer very much with that sort of thing anyway, but I'm certainly not gonna eat a whole bag of prunes over two days. I'm gonna use some of these, but I won't probably use them all. Anyway, Got no milk to make this porridge, so we're gonna to have to improvise. But also, I want to reserve some of the coarser grain out of this porridge. So, I'm gonna put this in the food processor and grind it up, and then I'm gonna sift it.
Okay, that's pretty good. Got oat flour. So that I will reserve in a separate container. I've got probably more oats left. This is that mostly oat bran, but there's still quite a lot of energy in there. Probably got a bit more there than I really need for breakfast this morning. So I'm gonna get another container. So I'll reserve some of that as well, because I might have a use for finer oatmeal. I reckon probably that's the amount I need for my porridge this morning. That looks about right. Now I don't have any milk for this porridge. I can, I could just make oatmeal with water. A lot of people do. I'm going to try to approximate some milkiness. I'm going to take this Bombay mix, and so I'm just going to pick the peanuts out of here. This could result in something that tastes a bit spicy in my porridge, but you know what? I'm all right with that. I think that might actually be quite interesting. And we're going to try and make these peanuts into a kind of milk substitute. So there's going to be a fair bit of this kind of sifting of ingredients in this challenge because We've only got six ingredients, only got six purchased items, and we've got to kind of make what we can out of them. I think that'll be enough peanuts. About half a cup of water, and then my handheld stick blender. And what we have there definitely isn't milk, but it is kind of creamy. But I think that's going to go okay with the porridge. So to make the porridge, I've just got those oats that I processed in the pan here, together with that liquid, the peanut liquid, and a bit more water. And I'm just gonna kind of warm this through until it starts to thicken. Some people like their porridge really cooked and really glutinous. I don't, I prefer my porridge to be kind of like warm muesli really. So I like the oats to still have a bit of bite to them. So I'm not gonna overcook this, just warm it through until it thickens. I actually think that's probably where we're gonna stop because it will continue to thicken as it stands, which it's doing by the minute. And then I'm just going to have five prunes, which I'll just cut up with scissors straight into there, just because it's easier than getting the board out. And that's breakfast. So, porridge with no milk. Not as creamy as porridge with milk, obviously, but still all right. It could definitely do with sugar, but I don't have any. So I'm just going to have to make do with the sweetness of the prunes. That little background note of Bombay spice from those peanuts is quite interesting. So I don't have sugar, but I do have salt. Salt on porridge is a true Scotsman thing, isn't it? Yeah, that was okay. That was a little bit plain, I would say, but certainly very filling. And that's going to give me the energy I need to keep me going all morning. Because with no fresh produce on this challenge, I really am going to have to bring my foraging game here. So in a minute we're going to go foraging, but first let's just get something going for dinner tonight. Dinner this evening is going to be based on this soup and broth mix, which is a mixture of barley and lentils and peas. You're meant to soak this for 12 hours, and I haven't had time to do that because I've only just started this challenge. So I'm just going to overcome that, I hope, by just cooking it longer. So I'm going to put this in the slow cooker and we'll leave it cooking all day. First, and this is a bit weird, I'm going to pick out all the green peas from this mixture because I've got only six different packs of stuff to create food from and I want to create variety so I've actually got to kind of reduce the diversity of this ingredient get the green peas out and we're going to make something later that just uses green peas so it's a bit of a faff and this is one of the things that people quite often criticize me for in these videos is that a lot of the stuff I have to do on these challenges is really fiddly and time-consuming and they're right that is true. Sometimes to solve a problem, you need to put some work in. The critique of that is obviously that this isn't realistic and people don't have time for this. But this isn't really about being realistic. This is about thinking on your feet and creating a response to a challenge. And so whilst it might look like what I'm doing here is learning to separate green peas from something else, I'm thinking on my feet. I'm trying to find a solution to a problem that seemed harder than it probably was and that's what these videos are really about they are about doing something that seems difficult as an exercise to kind of create a mindset where when you're faced with something that seems difficult you don't just curl up and say well that's impossible but you say okay well what can we do and yeah sure a lot of the things I do in these videos aren't very practical 
But that isn't the point. The point is that they are a solution to the problem. And so what I'm trying to do here is, in myself, is create a mindset where I tackle a problem not by saying, oh, well, that's not fair, I can't fix it, but by actually saying, okay, well, what can I do? So it's a question of focusing on opportunity rather than the problem. And I hope that goes some way to explaining what these videos are about. They're not about food. They're not even about saving money. They're about setting a challenge which is kind of stretch achievable. I'm not saying that this is a way of developing your brain so that you immediately come up with the best solution to every possible problem. Of course not. But the capacity to at least propose a solution to a problem is at worst marginally useful. And at best is how you deal with things. And apart from anything else, not giving up is potentially a happier way to exist. Right, I think that's as far as I'm going to sort that out. I, that's about as many peas as I really need for the thing I want to make tomorrow. So I'm going to put those in a separate container. The rest of that's going to go in the slow cooker. So I'm just going to put them aside to soak for, well, probably 24 hours. I don't have any soaking tablets or bicarbonate of soda to use with that, so I'm just going to have to soak them in water. The rest of the lentils and peas and barley, I'm going to put in a slow cooker. I will actually put a little bit more in there. I might regret that. And then, in fact, what I might just do is wash those now. So I might just give that a little scrub like that. Just tip, tip off that starchy water. Now, of course, that on its own is not going to be a very interesting dish. So we're going to find some flavours to put in there. We do have something that will help, which is these peppers. So I'm going to put the red peppers in with that bean mix. I'm going to save the yellow peppers for making something else. Gosh, there's quite a lot of oil in here. But that's not a bad thing because we're going to need some of that for other things. So I've got over half of my peppers left, plus most of the oil. So that lot, without wasting the oil as well, it's just going to go in there. Not adding salt at this point because that can sometimes cause beans and pulses to go tough or to fail to hydrate, or so they say. I'm sure somebody will tell me that's not true. And that still isn't going to be interesting enough like that. So we've got to go and find some other flavours. Foraging time. So we'll have a look down here, see what we can actually find to forage. So lots and lots and lots of stinging nettles. They're a little bit far gone now for picking, most of them, because you can see, well, let's find an example, this one there. They're starting to go to seed now. You see the seeds forming, or the flowers on them. So most of them are probably no good for picking. However, they're always outliers. And so if we look around, we'll find some that are growing in a slightly cooler or shadier spot that are still quite leafy, haven't got any signs of flowers on them, and we can probably pick the tops of those. If we just pick the top two to four leaves, they'll be perfectly okay, especially if we're gonna blend them to make soup or something. So here we go. Here's a patch where they're looking still quite young and fresh. So if we need to get some nettles, we'll just pick the top four leaves off of that. You can pick them later in the year if you find a patch that's been cut down and then regrown because they'll grow just like brand new plants. So just as an interesting point, this little bit of woodland here, which is just a tiny strip of woodland at the back of the recreation ground, when we first moved here, this was just grass. And none of these trees are older than about 20 years. But it's already recognizably a wood. It's all young trees, but this is what I'm hoping will happen on that field where I planted the acorns, that basically only takes 10 years before grassland will turn into woodland and so it's only got to be left alone for a little while for that to happen okay so here's an interesting thing this has probably got some potential these are hogweed buds not giant hogweed this is common hogweed and this is the flower bud here 
So I think we'll pick a few of those because the whole plant is edible. Sometimes it gets a bit tough and strong flavoured, but the young growths are usually quite nice. So I think the young flower buds could be an interesting vegetable. So as I say, this plant we've been looking at is common hogweed. This is not giant hogweed. Giant hogweed is a different species. It does look similar, obviously a lot bigger, slightly different leaves, but a more robust plant. And it is related, but you don't want to be picking giant hogweed. Giant hogweed contains a chemical that causes phytophotodermatitis. And what happens is you get the sap of giant hogweed on your hands or on your skin, it will cause you to basically experience severe sunburn. It makes your skin very, very sensitive to sunlight or any light. And you'll get huge blisters just from ordinary daylight. So don't touch giant hogweed. I haven't got any giant hogweed to show you actually because I never found it around here, but this is all common hogweed. That's the flower of hogweed. This is in the carrot family, Apiaceae, and yeah, it's got those characteristic umbelliferous flowers. And the leaves, well, you can kind of see how that's in the carrot family. They're very big, but they're still those kind of pinnate form. Anyway, enough talk. There's a nice bud that's still mostly closed, so we're going to have that one. Now when I pick this, I am of course depriving this plant of the opportunity to flower. Which, if I did it to the whole group of plants in the woods, that would be bad. So I'm not going to do that. I'm only going to pick a small number of these. So I am being quite picky in what I get today, but why not? There's plenty of it here, I might as well just select the bits I really want. So I've got a bit of hogweed there, and that might be enough for what I want, because I'm only feeding myself today, and I only need some sort of green vegetables to go with my pulses and other things. But let's see what else we can find, because we've really got to find some flavour now. These are elderflowers, really good for making a very tasty cordial or wine. They smell fantastic. Oh, they smell sort of grapey and fruity. And the whole flowers are edible, so I will probably pick some of these at some point over these two days. And we'll use them in a salad or something. But they're just at their peak now. Some of them still yet to open. Some of them fully open. Just only a few of them have gone over. They smell fantastic. I bet they taste good. Just down here is that swampy little pond that I did my ecosphere experiments starting with. It's really looking very sad. It probably needs a bit of a clear out this pond or else it's just going to turn into soil. There's hardly any actual water left here at all. There's a bit here covered with duckweed. The rest of it's just a swamp, which is okay, but you know, it's just nature taking its course, but it won't be a pond for very much longer. Right, what we've got here is interesting. I can't use it, and I'll explain why. But this plant here, which if you've been following, you will recognise as yet another member of the carrot family, Apiaceae. This one is called pig nut or earth nut. Very recognisable because of these very needle-like leaves. Again, you can see the pinnate form of the leaves, but they're very, very thin, slender leaves. It's a wiry plant, grows, well here, that's about the biggest specimen I've ever seen, growing about half a meter tall. Now, this plant here, if we were to dig down, we'd find underground a knobbly little tuber, which is carrot flavored and quite edible. I'm not going to dig them up because I don't have permission to dig on this land, so I'm going to have to leave those. But what I might do is come back later and harvest some of these seeds and grow this in my own garden so I can dig it up. I'll have to look and see how invasive it is before I do that. But anyway, that's a pig nut or earth nut. I think it's called Conopodium magus. I have eaten it before and it's good. It's a starchy little tuber carroty flavoured starchy thing. What's not to like? 
Right, down here by the stream, there has been wild garlic growing, and I've just got to figure out how to get down there safely. Might turn the camera off for that bit. Right, so this is where I picked some wild garlic earlier in the year, and you can see the leaves are still kind of there. It's really not worth picking most of the leaves of this wild garlic. There probably are a few examples that are just about usable, hanging around in shadier, darker places like this, but for the most part, the leafy part of this plant is now done and dusted for foragers. However, this is what happens after the plant finishes flowering. It has these little seed pods, little clusters of three seeds, and at the moment these are quite underripe. So at the moment there isn't really a hard seed in there at all, it's just a kind of fleshy seed pod, and I'm going to taste one of these now. Wow. It's like raw garlic. I mean, it is raw garlic, but it's like, whereas the rest of this plant is actually quite mild flavoured, seed pods are really, really intense garlic. That's going to be perfect for what I want today because I haven't got a garlic onion flavour in my purchased ingredients. So I'm going to pick a few of these and we're going to use them in that stew. And with any sort of group of plants like this, you'll find there are examples that are more or less developed than others during the growing season. They don't all flower at the same time and that's part of the plant's strategy to make sure that it gets in the right place for the pollinators and so on. So I'm going to be picking the ones that are still showing traces of petals because those are going to be the seed pods that are still most tender. So what I'll do, I'll just pick the whole stalk like that and we'll process it when we get home. And you can kind of get a feel for which ones are going to be more developed than others. The darker ones are probably further along than the lighter ones here. And that one there might have some hard seeds inside it. I don't think that'd be a problem. The seeds are edible as well as the rest of the plant. But I'm going to go for the younger, more fresh green ones this morning. I think that might be enough. And I know this plant probably gets too much exposure in my videos, but here we are again. We're down by water. And this lovely parsley looking plant here is hemlock water dropwort. Very deadly poisonous one of the most toxic plants in Great Britain. We won't be picking that. Despite the fact that it looks lovely and it looks like flat leaf parsley, it really isn't. It wants to kill you. So this plant here is cow parsley. I spoke about this in the foraging getting started episode. It's now gone to seed, so we've got these little seed pods here. The whole plant is edible, and I have identified this as cow parsley. I know this is not hemlock. This family, the carrot family, Apaceae, has got some real rogues in it, but also some real delicious vegetables and spices in it. So you have to be careful, you have to know what you're doing, you have to identify the species. There's no kind of quick rule of thumb. You need to identify the plant that's in front of you and then you'll know whether you can eat it or not. Anyway, it has these seed pods on it now. Now this plant is related to uh, cumin, caraway, coriander, so, what do these little seeds taste like? Come on, focus. So there's one of the little seed pods, and I'm going to give that a taste. Oh wow! Mmm! Okay, so it's like a citrusy version of coriander without the soapy flavour. I'm one of those people for whom coriander tastes soapy. Um, this doesn't taste soapy, but I can tell it's got that kind of coriander aroma to it. So this is an aromatic spice. How about that? Growing in Great Britain. So I've just picked one little umbel of seed pods, like that. That's all I'm going to need, I think, for my flavouring. Right, let's get home and get that in the pot. Okay, well that might seem like a quick way to get about, and indeed it is. But it's not easier than walking, I don't think. So anyway, I'm going to put these hogweed shoots in some water now. Just so they stay nice and crisp until I want them later. And let's investigate these garlic and cow parsley seeds. Interestingly similar sort of things, aren't they? But completely unrelated. I'm just going to pick off the little seed pods like that. Don't know how many we'll have in total. We'll just see how it goes. I can always save some of this for use 
in other dishes because I don't have onions don't really have much spices other than what's in the Bombay mix wow they're really pungent garlic scent which if you think about it makes sense garlic and onion plants produce those aromas to try to discourage animals from eating them and the part that the plants really don't want animals to eat is the reproductive bit the seeds so it kind of makes sense that they would concentrate the aromas in those parts of the plants but unfortunately for the plant humans have or at least some of us have decided we like that flavor so kind of that strategy backfired a little bit on the plants or did it because onions are very widely cultivated so it could be argued that onions actually stumbled on a strategy to make sure that we would ensure their survival right i think that's probably enough of those seeds they are quite pungent that's probably equivalent of about three or four cloves of garlic i'm going to give them a little smoosh with the flat side of the knife i'm not going to crush them completely but i'm just going to pop them so the flavor comes out and then those are going to go into the lentil and barley mixture it is a shame that we don't have something like paprika or tomato paste to make this a bit more colorful but it is what it is i'm probably going to turn that down to low now because it is boiling and these cow parsley seeds i'm just going to taste another one of these and then make a decision about whether we put them in or not yep i think it's going to be worth putting those in they are a little bit bitter so slightly bitter flavor but there is a flavor of strong parsley with a very slight citrus back note to it and some sweetness too i'm not going to put much in there because i don't want to overdo it just going to put like half a dozen pods in there it does seem like a tiny amount but i really don't want that to dominate i'd rather the garlic dominates if anything so i'll get that into the pot as well it is still only mid-morning but thinking ahead a little to lunch now i'm just going to open this pack of beetroot very carefully because this stuff will stain my shirt some might say that would be an improvement and my lunch is going to be soup, but I'm going to make a beetroot sort of cracker to go with it, I think. A beetroot and oat cracker. So in the food processor here, I've got two of my beetroot. I've got the oat meal that I didn't use for porridge this morning, plus another small handful of oats. And before we whiz that around, I have a grind of pepper in there as well. I won't put salt in there for the moment. What a lovely colour. Now, just going to have a look at this and see what kind of texture we've got. Yeah, it does already hold together like a dough. So that's as far as I'm going to take that. There is just one chunk of beetroot that somehow evaded. It's like a tough stalk, so I'm just going to lose that. The rest of that beetroot will go in the fridge. We'll use that later. For rules nitpickers, I am permitted to use the fridge. I just wasn't allowed to buy chilled ingredients. Right, and then this beetroot and oat mix here. That's good. That's forming... A nice dough so I'm just going to leave that like that in a ball and again we'll cover that and just leave it for a while this beetroot and oat dough has been resting for only about 10 minutes and now I'm just going to try to roll it out into a thin kind of cracker or oat cake doing this between two sheets of reusable non-stick baking uh, parchment this is like a woven stuff it's got a sort of non-stick coating and hopefully that's going to be enough to get that yeah rolled out into a nice thin cracker i'm going to get that in the oven and bake it relatively slowly but first just a little brush of this oil from the pepper jar and a little sprinkle of salt, which I'll just press into the surface. That's going to go in the oven at 180 Celsius for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. So just before that goes in the oven, I'm just going to run, just going to score it into portions with the blunt side of a knife. I haven't gone all the way through there. Just press the blunt side of a knife into it. And that will make it easier to break up, I hope. Okay, that was actually in the oven for about 20 minutes. It has come together quite coherently. It's 
just have a look at the underside. Yeah, I think that's probably cooked enough. I'm just going to let that cool and see what it does. I can always put it back in the oven and crisp it up a bit more if I need to. But I think if I cook it any longer than this, I'm going to start losing that lovely beetroot colour. I'm trying to avoid snacks between meals at the moment, but if I get peckish, I can always just munch on a bit of this Bombay mix. It is designed as a snack. But I thought I might actually try one of these oat cakes now. Because they are cooked. It's come out a bit softer than I thought it was going to. So it's a bit bendy. Let's give it a taste. That tastes really good. That's just like four ingredients. Well, five if you can include the oil. Beetroot, oats, pepper, salt, oil. And that's really tasty. I think if I was making that again, I would bake it lower and longer. So it dries out completely, but doesn't lose its color. Okay, so here's a bit of a weird idea. Bombay mix, which is basically gram flour noodles, or noodles made of gram flour, maize flour, potato starch, and vegetable oil, together with chili, caraway, cumin, lentils, peanuts, chickpeas. It's kind of the ingredients of a spicy chickpea soup there. So that's what I'm gonna be trying to make today for lunch. I'm gonna to try to blend this up, cook it down with water, and see if it makes a soup. I think it ought to. Okay, it's food processor time again, and I think we'll go for about that much, which is, what, a couple of handfuls of Bombay mix in there? I'm not being particularly precise with measurements. Well, it's not blending up particularly well. I've actually smashed this up and used it as breading before now for chicken and things like that, which is quite good. Never mind, I think what we'll do is we'll actually cook this down with some water and then blend it wet. That'll probably be easier. So, just a pan of water. Might need more water than that, but we'll see how we get on. And we'll just bring that to the boil and cook that until the noodles start to re-soften. As that comes to a boil, we can see those noodles are really starting to soften now. I can kind of break them up against the side of the pan. It might seem a bit strange making a soup out of essentially starch, but it is mostly gram flour, which is ground up chickpeas or garbanzo beans if you prefer. But yeah, it's kind of chickpea soup. It's just been cooked in a different form. I'm not going to try to put that hot into the big blender because I think that would be pretty disastrous. So I'm going to put it in this cup here and use the stick blender. Right, this is where we discover we need more water in there, but that's fine. Well, a little goes quite a long way, clearly. Let's give that a little taste. It's all right, actually. That's just, yeah, it's just like a chickpea soup. Hmm. Not going to waste that. I thought so. I just had to check the ingredients. It says potato starch. I can definitely taste potatoes in there. Hmm. I am going to add a bit more water to that because it's quite thick still. And I might actually save some of it because we might use that as an ingredient or something for something else. I'm just going to set that aside while we just cook one other thing. So I'll just brush my pan with a light coating of oil. And those stinging nettle tops I picked earlier at the park are just going to go straight in there. I say straight in there. I've shaken the bugs off them because we have got to try to avoid animals. And I'm just going to gently fry those in that oil. Really almost dry frying them. A lot of people are still very surprised about the fact that you can eat stinging nettles. And when you cook them like this, it destroys the sting. So you don't sting your mouth when you eat them. I don't know why people think that that would happen. They're covered with little stinging hairs, but cooking does destroy those stingers. These won't take very long at all, but I want them to kind of go almost crispy without burning. So we've just got to toast them gently. Yeah, they're drying out now and kind of toasting a little bit. Right, the nettles are done. I'm just going to bring that soup back up now. Just warm that back through. Make sure it's nice and piping hot. Well, the rest of that Bombay mix slurry I'm going to put in a pot. We'll use that for something else. I'm quite interested to see how similar this is to a kind of custard or egg mix. So that's given me an idea for something we can do tomorrow. Right, 
Right, well, I think that looks like not a bad lunch. So, this is spicy chickpea soup with beetroot and oat crackers topped with crispy nettles. Let's give it a taste. The Bombay mixed spices have really come through. That's really good. I'll tell you what, the sweetness of the beetroot together with the spices and the creaminess of this soup. Mm. This is something I wouldn't have actually guessed was done on a budget. Super, super happy with this one. I think this is going to be one of the high scoring meals. I think, as I say, the only thing I would do differently is to bake those beetroot and oat crackers for longer at a lower heat so they dry out and go completely crispy like oat cakes. But actually, as a kind of weird flatbread to dip in soup, they're quite nice like this. Well, actually, I thought that was delicious and I would be happy to be served that in a restaurant. Anyway, let's nip out and do a bit more foraging. This here is a fungus called Dryad Saddle. I think the largest uh, fungus that we have in, the, in Britain, that specimen is over and past its best. It could still be cut and dried and powdered and used as stock, but we need something smaller than that. And it's a bit late in the season, but we'll have a look around and see what else we can find. So all of this hillside here has been cleared. I can see another specimen just down there. And all of the stumps are growing this dryad saddle. And here are some, which are just perfect. Just nice little specimens, gonna be perfect for the pot. So, we'll cut a few of those. That's definitely a game changer in terms of flavor. This little pink flowered plant here is wild thyme. And that's gonna be a real flavor boost for that bean casserole. So what I'm gonna do is find a nice bit of it that can stand to be cut. Nice bit like that, there we go. So a nice bit like that without uprooting the plant in the basket. We'll have a few more bits like that because that will give us a really robust flavor, hopefully. And this plant here, which is actually more recognizable, oh, Eva, which is actually more recognizable on account of last year's dead flowers. This is wild marjoram. So this is like oregano. This is an elder tree. This piece is dead and it's got these fungi on it. Now they look very unpromising, don't they? But I'm picking those because I'll show you what happens. Well, when we get home, I'll show you what they do. They look very unpromising and dead, but this is a fungus that auto dehydrates. So in the, uh, in the summertime when it dries out, this will completely dry up to little crispy bits like this. Whoops, which I've dropped one off. Put it in the basket. I've dropped a bit down here somewhere. There it is. Uh, there's some more bits on the tree. I'm just going to pick them off. But this fungus has a magic trick, which is quite entertaining to watch. We'll see that when we get home. Now, I promised you a magic trick with these dried up jelly ear mushrooms that I picked off of these elder trees. So, here we go. Time-lapse time. So how about that? Pretty cool. And you can see why they're called jelly ears, because they're very, very ear-like. And 
also quite gelatinous. So these are going to be part of breakfast tomorrow morning for day two. I'm going to leave them soaking overnight. I'll probably change the water. I'm also going to soak some prunes because I know I need some of those as well. So wild marjoram and thyme. And I've given these a wash because they are quite low growing plants and the risk of soil splash is kind of present. Oh, it smells great. It's got that savoury herbal aroma that you get from thyme. It's not as strong as cultivated thyme in its flavour, but I will compensate for that by adding a bit more. I'm just going to strip off the leaves off the, all the little twigs here. And the marjoram, well, apart from the bottoms of the stalks, which are still probably soft enough to eat, the whole thing can be chopped up and used. Okay, this barley porridge, I turned this off before we went out. So this has just been sitting. It's now kind of warm. There's a lot more barley in here than I thought there was going to be because barley swells up and the other things don't so much. So what we've got here is like a barley risotto more, more than it is like a bean stew. Anyway, taste for seasoning. It definitely needs pepper. Most things do. It does need a bit of salt. Just give that a mix in and give that another taste for seasoning. So I think the thing to do is think of this as a risotto. The texture and so on is quite similar. Barley's gone sticky, but it's still got a bit of a bite to it. Let's taste that now. That's good. And that's perfectly tasty, just like that, actually, even just with that salt and pepper in there. But we're going to take it up a notch with those wild foraged herbs. And I'm just going to stir those in and let the residual heat kind of wilt them a little bit and infuse some of the flavours out. I will reheat this before we serve it. So mushrooms, these are the dryad saddle mushrooms. I'm going to cook these today and save those for tomorrow. Now usually with mushrooms I don't wash them because I just find it makes them unpleasant to handle. So I'm just going to see how that works for these because they are quite soil splashed. There's a little bit of soil in the pores underneath as well. So I'm going to give them a wash in cold water then pat them dry with a paper towel and then we'll cook them. So the thing with mushrooms, I just casually said, oh yeah, these are dryad saddle. There's a whole identification process that is necessary before you eat any wild food, but especially mushrooms because, well, it's interesting actually, because people think of mushrooms as being the thing that can kill you if you get it wrong. But if you're honestly, if you were to flip a coin and eat a random wild mushroom, you're less likely to die than if you flip a coin and eat a random green plant because actually the proportion of green plants that are poisonous to non-poisonous is greater than the proportion of mushrooms. But don't do that with anything. The trick is identify it conclusively before you eat it. That's a topic for a whole different video. So I won't be covering that in this one, but there is going to be a series already started about identifying edibles and about the skills you need if you're going to start foraging. Link will be in the video description if I remember. These mushrooms are called Dryad Saddle. I've never eaten them before, but I'm very confident about the identification. Apparently they smell of cucumber. Let's have a sniff. Yeah, I can see what they mean. They've got a kind of fresh, ever so slightly cucumbery smell to them. It's not that distinct. It's kind of fresh spring herbal smell. I'm also going to be cooking these hogweed buds that I picked earlier. I've just trimmed off the leafy tops. Somebody will in a minute tell me that's the best bit. And I think what I'll do with these is I'm going to halve them so we can see inside. Look, we can see the developing flowers inside there. Isn't that nice? That just also gives me the opportunity to check there's nothing lurking in there that I don't want to eat. So over a medium heat, we'll have a little bit of that oil. And then into that hot oil, those pieces of mushroom. I'm actually going to transfer that to the back burner and let that cook because I'm also going to warm up some of that barley risotto. That's just going to be the final cooking on those herbs and just warm that through. Those mushrooms are as cooked as I need them to be now. So I'm now going to toss in the hogweed shoots. Just give those a little shimmy. And this might seem weird. I'm just going to put in a bit of water so that they simmer and steam a little bit first and then they'll come back to frying. I 
Right, heat off, let's plate up. Okay, there we go. Barley risotto with dryad saddle and hogweed shoots. Right, okay. Well, there's plenty more of this if I want more risotto. Let's give it all a taste. So let's just try that barley risotto on its own first. It's really nice and gooey, but you can see separate grains in there. Hmm. And I can taste those wild herbs, the thyme and marjoram. Still does need a bit more salt. Barley, I guess, can take a lot of salt. Right, the wild mushrooms now. They've got quite a meaty texture. Mmm, they're good. And the hogweed shoots. Let's go for a little one that's kind of burst open. Hogweed shoots. That is a superb vegetable. I would put that on a par with asparagus. The only thing that's a bit weird about it is the stems stay a little bit hairy and fuzzy. The flavour is superb. It's like a somewhere between carrot and asparagus. Very sweet. Quite delightful texture as well. I think it was a bit of a disappointment how much barley there was in this soup mix. But that is what it is. If I'd bought a bag of lentils, it would have been more expensive. I'd have gone over budget. But what we've got here has got a good mix of carbohydrates and proteins. Some nice fresh vegetables on there. The mushrooms will have minerals and things in them. So yeah, happy with that. So I think this would have been difficult without those foraging ingredients, but here's the thing. As I said earlier, this is not about saving money. This is not about inventing recipes and so on. This is about kind of finding a solution. So if you were up against it and you had to do something like this and you couldn't find wild herbs, perhaps you could go and beg some herbs from a neighbor. Perhaps you could go and pick some herbs from a municipal planting or something like that. Or maybe you'd have herbs in the cupboard. The point is really about finding something that is possible. I think that was pretty good. I'm happy with that. There's plenty more of that barley, actually. So if I get hungry later, I can have some of that. Maybe I can smash up some Bombay mix and crumble that on top as a kind of seasoning. But anyway, that's everything for day one. I hope you'll join me on day two, where we've got to make another three different meals with those ingredients, plus what we've mashed to forage. Plus, maybe we'll get some other forage as well. So I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.